Tonight's program is based upon the book, Samuel Adams, A Life. And we are selling copies of these through our partnership with Barnes & Noble. Mr. Stoll will gladly sign copies after the question and answer session following his lecture. This evening's lecturer is, as I'm sure many of you are aware, a native of Worcester. Following in the tradition of David McCullough and Walter Isaacson, Ira Stoll is a journalist who has employed his research and storytelling skills to popularize American history. As a journalist, Mr. Stoll was a founder and managing editor of the New York Sun. He has been a consultant to the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal. He is the North American editor of the Jerusalem Post, managing editor and Washington correspondent of the Forward, editor of SmarterTimes.com, and reporter for the Los Angeles Times. He is a graduate of Harvard College and now resides in New York City. Please join me in welcoming Iris Stoll to the ASP. Thank you for that kind introduction, Jim. Um, and thank you all for making it out in the rain to come hear me tonight. Um, I actually thought that the rain would be a deterrent, but somebody explained to me while I was sitting in, in back there before the talk that actually the Red Sox game is in a rain delay, so <laughs> there's no contest. <laughs> It's also uh, great to be here in, in Worcester, uh, my hometown. I, I know I'm going to insult some people by not mentioning who I, everybody I see in the audience, but I, I see my pediatrician, Dr. Duggan, over there. I see Mr. Hughes and the Shane Heights, uh, who taught me at Worcester Academy, and who should not be blamed for anything that's in this book. Um, and it's also a pleasure, I, my parents, uh, most of all, uh, who are who are here and uh, helped, I think, invite a few of you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight at the American Antiquarian Society. In researching this book, I visited quite a few of the most rarefied archives in the country, and I can honestly say that the staff here at the Antiquarian Society was at the top of the heap of them in terms of helpfulness and efficiency. And the holdings are pretty impressive as well. In the files of this institution, I found an inventory of the estate of Samuel Checkley, the father of Samuel Adams' first wife. Checkley, a minister, had officiated at Adams' baptism and at both of his weddings. At, the Check at Checkley's house on South Street, this inventory of items included, along with a looking glass, a bearskin muff, four feather beds and other household items, a gun, suggesting that the 74-year-old clergyman may have taken to heart the Boston Town Meeting's admonishment the year before his death to be prepared in case of sudden danger. The inventory Adams conducted also included a series of items belonging to Checkley that were said to be at Mr. Adams's house. They included sheets, towels, handkerchiefs, teaspoons and other silverware, and gowns, raising the possibility that the ailing Checkley had moved in with Samuel Adams after Checkley's wife, Elizabeth, had died in July. <coughs> if nothing else, the fact that Adams helped conduct the inventory and the fact that so much of the property was at Adams' house underscored how close was the relationship between the minister and Adams. Even after Adams' uh, first wife, the <coughs> minister's daughter, had passed away and Adams had remarried. Uh, as Jim mentioned, the document is available for uh, you to all have a look af after the talk, and, and I think it's, it's telling how these documents, which this document uh, hasn't been mentioned in any of the seven other biographies of Samuel Adams that have been written, um, can shed light on, on the family of this patriot and on uh, his religious beliefs about which more later. I was also aided in my research by several books and collections published by or with the assistance of the Society that can be accessed without having to come here and enjoy this magnificent reading room. In my book, I quote Isaiah Thomas, the publisher of the Massachusetts Spy, writing about the Boston Gazette, a newspaper that Samuel Adams wrote for, 
in his classic 1810 history of printing in America. During the long controversy between Great Britain and her American colonies, no paper on the continent took a more active part in defense of the country or more ably supported its rights than the Boston Gazette. Its patrons were ever alert and ever at their posts, and they had a primary agency in events which led to our national independence. Thomas said that the most distinguished revolutionary patriots in Boston, including Samuel Adams, frequently convened at this celebrated Gazette office for meetings to concoct many of the measures of opposition to the British Acts of Parliament for taxing the colonies, measures which led to and terminated in the independence of our country. The addition of Isaiah Thomas's history of printing in America that I quote in the book was edited by Marcus McCarson, who was the Antiquarian Society's longtime director. An Antiquarian Society volume on the press in the American Revolution, edited by Bernard Balin and John Hench, proved another valuable resource, as did the online database of early American newspapers. So I want to thank the American Antiquarian Society and its supporters, not just for inviting me to speak here tonight, but for all the help along the way in making this book possible. More broadly, since we're here in Worcester, I also want to begin by mentioning a thing or two about the role Central Massachusetts played in Samuel Adams' career. Adams had a sister who was married to a minister in Holden, so this was in some sense familiar ground. But Worcester was also a frequent stop for Adams between his hometown of Boston and the meeting place of the Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and his stays here took on the tenor of the overall struggle between the colonists and Britain. In November of 1774, when Samuel Adams and his cousin John stopped in Worcester on the way back from the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia, they were serenaded by two young ladies who sang the returning delegates the New Liberty Song, including such rousing lyrics as, and I understand that Moscow Symphony is, <laughs> is playing in Mechanics Hall tonight, so I'm not going to try to compete with them musically, even if I did try, I would not succeed, but bear with me. The delegates have met for wisdom all renowned, freedom we may expect from politics profound. Illustrious Congress may each name be crowned with immortal fame. If Gage should strike the blow, we must for freedom fight. Undaunted courage show while we defend their right. In spite of the oppressive hand, maintain the freedom of the land. Worcester could also, though, be a less joyous spot. After the, classes, the clashes of Lexington and Concord, the ones that we remembered yesterday on Patriots Day, Adams and Hancock lingered in Worcester from April 24th to 27th, 1775, where, to judge by a letter Hancock sent to the Committee of Safety, they felt a bit like castaways. Mr. S. Adams and myself just arrived here. Find no intelligence from you and no guard, Hancock wrote. How are we to proceed? I'd like to talk a bit about why we should remember Samuel Adams. One good reason is that he played a significant, even a central role in founding our country. A signer of the Declaration of Independence, he gave the order to begin the Boston Tea Party and gave the name to the Boston Massacre and pressed on in the cause of self-government for the colonies at moments when many of his colleagues had given up or were ready to abandon the cause. Another, for those of us from Massachusetts, is that he played a significant role in leading the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, helping to draft and win passage of the state constitution that, as amended, is still the law of the state, and serving as clerk of the State House of Representatives, president of the state senate, lieutenant governor, and governor. My book is a work of history, but one of the questions I'm often asked is why we should care about Samuel Adams today. Why Samuel Adams Matters, as the title of this talk puts it. So let me attempt a few more answers. At a time when America has elected our first black president, Adams was the founder who, unlike Jefferson, Madison, and Washington, never owned a slave, refused one when he was offered one as a gift, and called the slave trade odious and abhorrent. At a time when most of us are a lot poorer than we were two years ago, 
Adams was among the least wealthy of the founding fathers, one whose wife wrote to him that she was short of cash, and one who knew that there were other things, like freedom, family, and faith, that are more important than money. At a time when newspapers are endangered, Adams was a newspaper columnist who used the press to spread the ideas of the revolution. At a time when religion is under attack from outspoken atheists, Adams was both one of our most religious founding fathers and one of the most significant ones, and an example of how religion can be a force for good in politics. At a time when there's a debate over whether the rest of the world is ready for freedom and democracy, and over how hard America should fight for it, Adams was one of the most stalwart and articulate believers in the idea that freedom can be universal and that it is worth fighting for. At a time when Americans are having tea parties to protest taxes, Adams was an ardent opponent of taxation without representation who had also served as a tax collector and who, after the revolution, favored a hard line against those rebelling against taxes that had been imposed by the duly elected government of Massachusetts. Let me try to expand briefly on a few of these points, one at a time. I had an op-ed piece in the New York Daily News the week of the presidential election commenting on Barack Obama's statement on election night. If there is anyone out there who still wonders if the dream of our founders is alive in our time, tonight is your answer, Obama said. Which founders could Obama have been talking about? Thomas Jefferson, the drafter of the Declaration of Independence, was a slaveholder. George Washington, our first president, was a slaveholder, though his will dictated that his slaves would be freed upon his death. James Madison, the drafter of the Constitution, was a third slaveholding founder. Madison believed that freed slaves should be sent back to Africa. The Constitution with which these founders created America counted slaves as three-fifths of a person. There's no record of Samuel Adams dreaming of a black president, but of all our founding fathers, he's the one perhaps most likely to have done so. There's a family story that Samuel Adams refused to accept a slave he'd been offered as a gift. He never himself held a slave. And when the slaves in Massachusetts petitioned for liberation, they directed their appeal to Adams, using some of the same arguments Adams himself was using against the British. The Massachusetts House of Representatives that Adams helped lead approved an act banning the slave trade, but the British appointed governor refused to sign it into law. Later, Adams helped draft and win passage of the Massachusetts state constitution that led judges to outlaw slavery in the state in 1781. The federal constitution, on the other hand, included a provision that prevented Congress from banning the importation of slaves for a 20-year period. Adams reacted by rejoicing that a, time, that a door was now to be opened for the annihilation of this odious, odious abhorrent practice in a certain time. As governor of Massachusetts, he signed a certificate of freedom for a black man, William Newton, who he described as being of good character. Adams has been falsely, in my view, accused of racism for supposedly discounting the testimony of a Boston Massacre witness because the witness was black. But he was citing the testimony of another witness who was also black, but who he thought was more reliable. That is what we know about Adams and race. What about Adams and money? Other founding fathers, such as John Hancock and George Washington, were wealthy men. Samuel Adams was hardly lower class. He went to Harvard, and his father owned a house and land in Boston. But he was poor enough that he, when he went off to Congress, the people of Boston had to take up a collection to buy him a new suit. I glory in being what the world calls a poor man, he wrote his wife. She wrote back that she was short of cash. Not the first wife of a politician or a journalist to make that complaint. The relationship between Hancock and Adams was made more awkward by the financial gap between the two men. When Hancock was elected governor of Massachusetts, Adams seemed a bit jealous. His reaction was to write, so fascinating are riches in the eyes of mankind. The two men's reconciliation coincided with the decline in Hancock's fortune. What about Adams and religion? Samuel Adams was a devout Congregationalist Christian whose faith motivated him and strengthened him in the revolutionary cause. He often argued that God was on the side of the revolutionaries. 
He was the son of a deacon and married the daughter of a minister. I spoke earlier about his close relationship with his father-in-law, the minister Samuel Checkley. Two of St. Adam's cousins, Amos and Zabdiel Adams, were also ministers, as was his brother-in-law Holden. Adams wrote of the rights of the colonists as men, as British subjects, and also as Christians, referring directly to that liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. I wish we were a more religious people, he wrote to his wife. The Massachusetts Constitution Adams drafted and helped pass provided for freedom of conscience, but it also allowed for taxes to be imposed to support public Protestant teachers of piety, religion, and morality. Certain elected officials were required to declare that I believe the Christian religion and have a firm persuasion of its truth. John Adams called his cousin Samuel a man of real as well as professed piety. After retiring as governor of Massachusetts, he sat with the choir at Old South Church, often selecting the tune and leading in that part of public worship. If Christians can relate to Samuel Adams, then so too perhaps can Jews. Adams studied Hebrew at Harvard, and again and again, both subtly and directly, Adams placed the American colonists in the role of the Israelites fleeing slavery in Egypt, and likened the British to the oppressive Egyptians. Writing in the Boston Gazette on August 8, 1768, Adams referred to the British as the taskmasters, a term the Bible uses to describe the Egyptians. Earlier, he had referred to the Stamp Act as a, quote, very grievous and we apprehend unconstitutional tax, echoing the language that Exodus, and um, some people may recall the Passover Haggadah, uh, uses to describe the very grievous hail, cattle disease, and locust plagues. From Philadelphia, Adams wrote home to Massachusetts that the heart of the British king, George III, is more obdurate, and his disposition towards the people of America is more unrelenting and malignant than was that of Pharaoh towards the Israelites in Egypt. In a speech his fellow, to his fellow members of the Continental Congress, Adams is said to have credited God with providing the Americans a cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, which had, according to the Bible, also guided the Israelites in the wilderness after Egypt. One Massachusetts preacher even compared Samuel Adams to Moses. In addition to Samuel Adams and re religion, and perhaps uh, related to it, there's the question of the universality of freedom. One of the uh, less favorable reviews of this book says that by the time I'm done, I've convinced, at least myself, that Samuel Adams would have supported the war in Iraq. Of course, the words Iraq or President Bush do not appear in this book, but I do think that in the debate, such as it is, over whether Middle Easterners are capable of democracy or worthy of freedom, Samuel Adams would have sided with those who thought they are. Even savages, he wrote, are capable of freedom, debating his cousin John Adams, who was a bit more elitist. Of course, Samuel Adams couldn't have imagined American troops invading a country across the world, but on the other hand, he did welcome French assistance in the American Revolution. More generally, Samuel Adams can teach us something about coping with tough times. The American colonists had declared independence from Britain back in July of 1776. That year, their plight was so bleak, there was not much to give thanks for. The journals of the Continental Congress record no Thanksgiving in 1776. Only two days of solemn fasting and prayer. For much of 1777, the situation was similarly desperate. British troops controlled New York City. The Americans had lost the strategic stronghold of Fort Ticonderoga, in upstate New York to the British in July. <laughs> On September 11th, troops led by General George Washington had lost the Battle of Brandywine, in which 200 Americans were killed, 500 wounded, and 400 captured. In Pennsylvania, early in the morning of September 21st, another 300 American soldiers were killed or wounded, and 100 captured in a British surprise attack that became known as the Pale Way Massacre. The British captured America's largest city, Philadelphia, on September 26th. Congress, which had been meeting there, fled briefly to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 
then to York, 100 miles west of Philadelphia. <coughs> One delegate to Congress, John Adams, wrote in his diary, the prospect is chilling on every side, gloomy, dark, melancholy, and dispiriting. John Adams' cousin Samuel gave the other delegates, their number had dwindled from, to a mere 20 from the 56 who had signed the Declaration of Independence, a talk of encouragement. He predicted, good tidings will soon arrive. We shall never be abandoned by heaven while we act worthy of its aid and protection. He turned out to have been correct, at least about the good tidings. On October 31st, a messenger arrived with news of the American victory at the Battle of Saratoga. The American general, Horatio Gates, had accepted the surrender of 5,800 British soldiers and with them 27 pieces of artillery and thousands of pieces of small arms and ammunition. The victory at Saratoga turned the tide of the war. News of it was decisive in bringing France into a full alliance with America against the British. Congress responded to the event by appointing a committee of three that included Samuel Adams and his close collaborator, a Virginian, Richard Henry Lee, to draft a report and resolution. The report, adopted November 1st, declared Thursday, December 18th as a day of thanksgiving to God, so that with one heart and one voice, the good people may express the grateful feelings of their hearts and consecrate themselves to the service of their divine benefactor. It was the first of what were to be many thanksgivings ordered up by Samuel Adams. After the revolution, Adams, who was eventually elected governor of Massachusetts, maintained the practice of declaring these holidays. In October of 1795, the 73-year-old governor proclaimed Thursday, November 19th as a day of public thanksgiving to God, recommending that prayer be offered that God would graciously be pleased to put an end to all tyranny and usurpation that the people who are under the yoke of oppression may be made free, and that the nations who are contending for freedom may still be secured by his almighty aid, and further that the peaceful and glorious reign of our divine Redeemer may be known and enjoyed throughout the whole family of mankind. A year later, Governor Adams offered a similar Thanksgiving proclamation. These statements were greeted with cynicism and derision by some of Adam's younger political opponents who saw them as archaic. One of them, Christopher Gore, wrote to a friend that it would be an occasion for a real day of Thanksgiving when Adams finally retired. <laughs> it turned out, though, that the ideas of thanking God for America's blessings and of praying for the spread of freedom everywhere would long outlast Adam's career. So, the question gets asked, if Adams was so instrumental in achieving American independence and so influential even afterward, why then has his fame faded so badly with time, so that he's now best known as, as a beer? <laughs> it's a long-standing problem. As early as the week of Samuel Adams' death, his friends were warning of the risk that he would be basely forgotten. A few years later, in 1809, John Adams wrote to a friend that the portrait of Washington ought not to shove aside those of Samuel Adams and John Hancock in Faneuil Hall. Without the character of Samuel Adams, the true history of the American Revolution can never be written, John Adams insisted. <coughs> One prominent 19th century Massachusetts historian, Abner Cheney Goodell, Jr., spoke to the Massachusetts Historical Society in 1833 about the cool presumption with which Samuel Adams has been stripped of his laurels to crown others. Amid the resurgence of interest in America's founders in recent years, Samuel Adams has faded into the background, especially in comparison to his cousin John, so much so that contemporary writers often simply refer to Adams, assuming that the reader will understand that the reference is to John, not Samuel. Other founders have gained stature at Samuel Adams' expense. I don't want to overstate it. Um, some people have recognized Samuel Adams' importance. Uh, Yale professor of history Edmund Morgan wrote in 1953, probably no American did more than Samuel Adams to, to bring on the revolutionary crisis. But Morgan was the exception rather than the rule. 
Part of the explanation may be the relatively scant written record Samuel Adams left behind. George Washington's collected writings fill 36 volumes, 38 if you include the two-volume index. Samuel Adams, a mere four. John Adams recalls seeing his cousin in Philadelphia cutting up with his scissors whole bundles of letters into atoms that could never be united and throw them out of the window to be scattered by the winds. This was in summer when he had no fire. In winter, he threw whole handfuls into the fire. Samuel Adams urged the people he was writing to to exercise similar discretion, ending one wartime letter with the command, burn this, a command we know was ignored. One historian was so frustrated by what he termed an exasperatingly meager paper trail on Samuel Adams' early years that he turned hostile, diagnosing the Patriot leader as a neurotic with an inferiority complex. Another part of the explanation is that Adams never held national office as a president or vice president or treasurer secretary. He never represented his country as an ambassador or a minister of a foreign land. He was a Massachusetts man whose post-revolution service was to his home state rather than the national government. But to see him strictly as a regional figure would be inaccurate. After all, he served seven years in Congress, most of it in Philadelphia, and through his relationships with fellow founders like Christopher Gadsden of South Carolina and Arthur and Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, as well as with Jefferson, John Adams, and George Washington, he helped to join the colonies into the United States. His influence was felt as far away as London. Another reason Adams' reputation has been tainted, without adequate justification in my view, is his association with mob violence. And um, here, uh, I should mention that Worcester, Worcester also uh, plays a, a role, and not a particularly admirable one. Um, fans of the uh, young adult historical novel uh, Johnny Tremaine may know that its author, Esther Forbes, uh, is from Worcester, and uh, there's a there's a passage in there um, where it says, look at Sam Adams. If he looks as pleased as an old dog fox with a fat pullet in his mouth, we'll know they've agreed to violence if everything else fails. Um, also, the HBO miniseries on John Adams um, portrays Samuel Adams looking on during a tar and feather. Uh, God, Sam, that's barbarism, John cries to his cousin who stands silent. Do you approve of this? Answer, Sam, can you? Uh, so let me defend uh, Samuel Adams' reputation a little bit from this accusation of mob violence. Uh, it's fair to say that Adams was no Gandhi, no adherence to nonviolence as a principle of opposition to the British as a colonial power. But neither was he a Robespierre who enthusiastically drenched the French Revolution in the blood of counter-revolutionaries. There were all of three tar and featherings of customs and formers during the revolutionary era in Boston, all of them spontaneous. And as brutal and reprehensible as those actions were, there's no evidence at all that Adams or any of his prominent associates approved or participated or were at the scene of any of them. Adams knew that such violence might backfire and, and hurt the popularity of the colonial cause. I think, though, that the negativity towards Adams is related not only to this charge of violence or the fact that he cut up his correspondence or the fact that he was never a president or vice president of the United States, but towards a feeling that the country has changed so thoroughly since his time that he has little to say to modern Americans. The changes in religion alone are such that in Adams' home state of Massachusetts, once overwhelmingly congregationalist, now about half the residents identify themselves as Catholic, a uh, religion that Samuel Adams was quite hostile toward, although he eventually reconciled himself to the help of the most Catholic king of France in the Revolutionary War. The Tories accused Adams of hiding behind a religious mask. Other critics acknowledge that his faith was genuine, but fault him for his intolerance of disbelievers and those who did not share his congregationalism. But one 
can differ with Adams' contempt for Catholics, object to his support for a ban on theater in Boston, and disagree with his approval of the taxation of non-congregationalists to support the Congregational Church, while at the same time finding much to respect and admire in Adams' religion. He was flexible enough to allow him to defend the, the deist patriot Thomas Young, to maintain a warm relationship with the relatively skeptical Thomas Jefferson, and to accommodate an alliance with that King of France. Yet he was firm enough to inspire Adams to engage and endure in the revolutionary cause, confident in his belief that God would protect Americans so long as they were virtuous, just as God had stood by the Israelites in their exodus from slavery so long as they were virtuous. To dismiss Adams as the last of the Puritans would be to suggest that after him, Americans ceased believing they were on a God-given mission to advance freedom. It would be a misinterpretation. <clears throat> Finally, distancing us from Adams is the puzzle of his personality. Edward Everett, the president of Harvard, governor of Massachusetts, and the United States congressman, said in a speech at Lexington in 1835, marking the 60th anniversary of the battle there, that in all the excitement and turmoil of the anxious days that preceded the explosion, Adams was one of the few who never lost their balance, a fact ever attributed to Adams' religious tranquility. What a wonderful phrase, religious tranquility, and how paradoxical. A tranquil revolutionary. It was a characteristic that Adams shared with his Puritan forefathers, of whom the Harvard historian Perry Miller has written that the characteristic of them that remains the most difficult to evoke was their peculiar balance of zeal and enthusiasm with control and wariness. All the founders are in some sense remote, separated from us by centuries and by the difficulty of evoking both the physical and political challenges they faced and the resolve with which they met them. Adams, because he was so influenced by Puritanism that is no longer practiced, can seem one of the remote, most remote of all. But he may not be as remote as had been thought. We can see Samuel Adams today when we see Americans for whom religion is central to their lives. We can see him when we encounter Americans who have higher values than material possessions. We can see him when we see what leaders and individuals around the world endure amid great risks in revolutions for freedom. These may not be qualities that correspond neatly to today's political factions, but they are aspects of the American spirit, and Samuel Adams would add, of the human one. That just scratches the surface. To learn more, I encourage you to read the book. I'd be happy to sign as many copies as anyone wants to buy. I thank you again all for coming out on this rainy night, and I very much look forward to answering